This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast, one of the few, if not the only podcast where you can actually learn substantive economics just by listening. And as you may know, we have been working our way through slowly Murray Rothbard's magnum opus, Man, Economy, and State. And that's primarily what this podcast is all about, the great books, particularly those in the Austrian tradition. And over the past few weeks, we've gone through chapters one through five, and most recently, we've gotten into this large section of the book uh, about production, the structure of how we get goods and services into the economy. And so Rothbard uh, spent a lot of chapter five going to the sort of the vertical structure of production. You and I see uh, consumer level goods and services, but we don't see all the various stages of capital investment along the way in the form of higher order goods unless we happen to be involved in a particular industry. So chapter five was really all about uh, the temporal nature of production and higher and lower order goods. But as we move into chapter six, uh, it is all about interest rates. Uh, as part of the the structure of production, because people oftentimes need to borrow capital. They need to borrow money to make this happen. Now, if you've been listening along uh, throughout the show a long time ago, probably more than a year or so ago, we worked our way through Bomberwerk's second volume of his three-volume treatise, and we got really uh, an understanding of interest rates that we had not uh, received from, necessarily from Carl Menger. And as we went through Human Action, Mises' great book, we, of course, again, worked our way through interest rates. But this time, we are doing it in the uh, from Rothbard's perspective. I'm very pleased to have with us this week in studio to help me do this, our great friend Christopher Hansen, who is at the University of Angers in France with Dr. Guido Halsman, but is also one of our summer fellows and originally from Shakespeare's Denmark. So welcome, Christopher. It's great to be here. Thank you. Now, that doesn't mean I think Shakespeare was from Denmark. It just means he liked to talk about princes and kings and that sort of thing. Uh, so great to have you in studio. We just finished a, a wonderful week of Mises U, going through Man, Economy, and State. And, you know, you and I had spoken offline earlier about the, the way the book's organized and laid out. And it struck me that most uh, economics treatises would have a section on interest rates in the, in the money and banking section, whereas Mises puts it in, in the part of the book that is about production of goods and services. So you, you had some thoughts on that. Yeah. yeah, it's very interesting when we just look at the layout of uh, man, economy, and state, that in a sense, we cannot come to uh, the question of interest rates earlier than this, and we are already on page 360 or something. But it's also, uh, we cannot come to it later, because Rothbard sets out in the beginning, chapter one is just man acting in isolation, so we get the basic concepts of means and ends, time preference, and so on. Chapter two introduces society, prices. Chapter three, a, r- a really good discussion discussion of price formation in chapter three and chapter four, and re- the introduction of money, and all these elements, and then chapter five with this, uh, with the structure of production, and all these elements are necessary in order for us to be able to even uh, speak about the rate of interest. And I had a brief look through uh, the index and through the first chapters, and he doesn't mention interest rates at all until uh, section seven in chapter five, when he gives us the first little teaser of interest rates. And I think it was, the reason that he does this in this way is that we need the basic determinant of interest rates, of the rate of interest, is time preference. The universal fact that we all prefer satisfaction of our, of our needs sooner rather than later. But this alone is not enough to explain, to, to give us the interest rate in isolation from other economic factors. That is, I mean, the rate of interest is not a price for waiting or a price for time in some sense. We need both. Uh, we need prices. We need a good understanding of what a price is because uh, in Rothbard's understanding and uh, in Mises's, the interest rate is not a price in itself, but a ratio between prices. And we need money introduced because we can only understand the rate of interest in money terms. There is no such thing as an own rate of interest of potatoes or apples or cars or whatever. So that's why only now, after wading through uh, 
360 pages can we come to this key uh, ingredient in understanding the structure of production? So Rothbard's writing this in the 1950s. If we go back to then, you know, this this chapter and the you know Rothbard's economics in general are are generally uh, thought to express a pure time preference theory of interest. Now, how radical of an idea is that in the 1950s as opposed to the prevailing orthodoxy at the time? I mean, there's, there's, it's still high, highly debated today. If we look at just at the footnotes in this chapter, we see that uh, Rothbard draws a lot on. First of all, on Mises, but also on Ben Barwerk and Hayek and Feder. So the pure time preference theory was, I mean, it was sort of well known and well established, but it was, was by no means the dominant position. You could still find Marxists around mm-hmm. much more than today who would, despite the demolition job that uh, Ben Barwerk already had done on Karl Marx and on all exploitation theories of interest um, back in the 18, 1890s, They'd still insist that any interest payment at all was just a deduction from the just wages of um, of labor. So that's kind of the, uh, it's by no means the dominant interest theory in the 50s or since for that matter. But it's kind of out there when Rothbard is writing. Another approach that he doesn't really uh, tackle in this part of the book is uh, Keynesian liquidity preference theory. But it basically explains interest rates as as an outcome of liquidity preference. And while I, I think that we can make good use of a, well, not necessarily of a concept of liquidity preference, but of a concept uh, concept similar to it, it has nothing at all to do with the uh, rate of interest. So one thing I get out of this chapter, which I think we forget about sometimes, is that we tend to think of interest rates as being charged to... Uh, borrowers buy capitalists and then they go out and produce things with them and hopefully make a profit and they pay repay the interest and then they're happy but what what Rothbard takes pains to point out is that there's even though there's value added at each stage of production between consumption and production there can be multiple stages multiple levels on that vertical ladder that we've been discussing and that somebody needs to be paid interest at each stage along the way. In other words, these tend to be different firms involved all the way along. And so the whole thing is more complex maybe than we imagine. Yeah, Rothbard is at pains to make clear that the producer's loan market is really almost irrelevant to an understanding of uh, what the rate of interest is. To Rothbard, the rate of interest is the price differential between the prices that the capitalist pays for his inputs and the prices that he, in turn, uh, get in return for the output, for the final output okay. of his uh, product. And there has been some debate among Austrians that it is problematic to talk about exchanging present goods versus future goods because you can never know that it will be the same good in the future. But Rothbard, although there is a little ambiguity in the way Rothbard phrases it at times, Rothbard is, uh, is at pains to make clear that what we are exchanging in a time transaction. It's always present money against future money in Somerset. That is against the present expectation of acquiring money in the future. And this is the reason why there must be a positive rate of interest. That is that the present money must be valued higher than just the present expectation of future money, simply because that a present good is always due to the law of time, prefer- time preferences always valued more more highly than the same future good. Now Rothbard says that we can conceive of this time exchange in two ways. The first one and the one that I think it's people mostly think about when we talk about interest rate is that you exchange present money for a claim on future money. So basically loan transaction. This is so all, you, you get a house today, and, yeah. and as a result, the mortgage company has a claim against your future payments. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, it, it's, it's probably the way that most of us encounter the phenomenon of interest rates is that we pay our mortgage, we pay car loans, consumer loans, etc. But the fundamental, or rather the primary time transaction is not this loan transaction. It is rather when the uh, capitalists at the outset of production hire the services of uh, original factors, laborers and landowners, and buy other inputs that they need for their production process. Now, 
these capitalists pay present money to the factor owners. And in return, they get the factor services uh, of labor, land, and so on, which will eventually mature into uh, whatever product they are interested in. And this final product can then again be sold either to uh, the consumers, if it's a consumer good, or to uh, capitalists in the next lower stage of production. And it is this spread this, uh, between the output price and the input prices that is the interest rate. There's again a little ambiguity here because what the landowners and laborers give to the capitalist is not future money, as it would be in a loan contract, but the future good which can then in turn be sold for money. Now, since we are talking about the pure rate of interest as it would be in the evenly ro rotating economy, there can never be any doubt to the capitalist that the appraised value of the final good, that is his expectation of what he can sell it for, will also be the actual uh, sales price when he arrives at, at the end of the production process. But in the real world, of course, this is very uncertain so we can already here see that, we, uh, as Rothbard will elaborate later on in, uh, when he deals with change in entrepreneurship in Chapter 8, that the capitalist is always, in reality, is always an entrepreneur and to a much greater extent uh, than the other functional categories. So if we're thinking about interest rates in terms of time preference, ideally between <laughs> savers and borrowers, Everyone's time preference is subjective. Everyone's is different, but yet a, a, a rate of interest manages to arise on the market, at least when that market is left relatively unhampered. But Rothbard takes pains a couple points in this chapter to sort of go after this mainstream idea. Well, there's got to be some sort of objective rate of return. In other words, uh, he doesn't specifically spend a lot of time going after neoclassicals or Marxists or Keynesians in terms of their faulty conception of what interest rates really are and how they arise. But he does give this sort of general criticism that there's no such thing as an objective rate of return. And so help us understand that. Now, I forget the page number, but he does have a critique of the idea that, um, of the neoclassical idea that, okay, we have the supply of savings that is determined by the uh, time preferences of, of the savers. But the demand for savings cannot be determined by this factor. It is rather determined by the marginal uh, efficiency of capital, that is, the value productivity of all the investments. And Rothbard says, well, if you look at the economy from just from the point of view of the individual businessman, this uh, kind of makes sense because the individual businessman is confronted with, on the one hand, the possibility of borrowing money at a certain rate of interest, and on the other hand, various investment projects that he expects will yield various returns will have various degrees of value productivity, so to speak. So he will obviously, confronted with these facts, he will borrow uh, money at in interest rate X, assuming that he can make a return at interest rate with a rate of return of Y, Y being larger than X. But the problem here is that this, this way of phrasing it assumes what is to be proven, namely that the investment projects will, uh, will yield a more valuable product and that there will be this spread between input prices and output prices. So we never really get to the uh, final explanation of, of interest rates in this way of looking at it. Well, so, you, you know, you mentioned Marx earlier and the, the Marxist conception that interest is almost per se exploitative. I thought one of the most interesting parts of this entire chapter is actually at page 373 and 374, where, where Rothbard's talking about capitalist advance uh, basically goods, uh, present goods for future goods. And in a sense, employees exchange future goods for present goods. So I, I, I thought that in just a couple of pages, in a sense, Rothbard gives us a mini course of where he demolishes the entire concept of, of Marx of, of capitalism being exploitative. No, no, no. You're, you are getting something uh, of value today, something certain, something in hand, whereas the capitalist who is advancing funds is getting something uncertain in the future. There's a, a, an element of time in there. There's an element of uncertainty. There's an element of risk of loss. A and so workers are getting paid today. Now, So I thought that that was just, as an aside, uh, a demolition of Marxism in two neat pages. Oh, oh, oh yeah. I mean, definitely. Um, 
that basically goes at uh, Bavak's final refutation of Marx, that we uh, think it's the final chapter of, of uh, Karl Marx and the close of his system, where uh, Ben Bavak says that, okay, the laborers insist on being paid the full value of their labor. And let us just assume that there are no other factors for production, so it's just labor. But in a sense, there's nothing stopping them from being paid the full value of their labor. They just have to be willing to wait until the final product is produced. So what, when they say this, this Marxian slogan, all they have to do is wait. And if they are not willing to wait, if, they, if their time preferences are so high that they'd rather prefer the money, uh, the discounted value now rather than the full value later, then there's no exploitation in the capitalists providing them with this. Well, in part because this has such a textbook feel and because uh, Rothbard is writing in somewhat of a dry technical fashion here, you don't always get the sense of how damning <laughs> what he's saying really is. Uh, in other words, he brings up the old neoclassical trinity of land, labor, capital, mm. and says, well, that's that's pretty much bunk. There's actually capital is actually much more uh, heterogeneous than stated. And it, and profit for, for the capitalists doesn't come from land or capital equipment. It comes because we prefer present goods over future mm. goods, and the capitalist is taking a risk. Yeah. So as you're reading this sort of dry description of all this, you might be missing w- that he's actually laying waste to entire schools of thought along the way. Yeah. Well, at some points, Rothbard sets out to consciously refute opposing doctrines, but most of the time he's just concerned with elaborating correct theory, integrating the contributions of Mises, Ben Barwerk, Hayek, and so on. But that in itself obviously provides the best refutation possible because uh, once you have a correct theory, then all the false theories kind of fall by the wayside. But... um, in the case of Marx, I think that's a good example because I don't think he ever really mentions Marx at all in, in, in this book. But when we're thinking about workers, there's always this labor versus management thing, mm-hmm. which is so tedious mm-hmm. and so played, and especially in the information age. All of this has become far more murky than it was, let's say, even 150 years ago when there was sort of a factory owner and a factory worker, and, and one person was doing real physical labor, and the other person was sort of doing blue collar, excuse me, white collar work in accounting or something like that. Yeah. And, and of course, all that is is blurred today. But I I just want to stress here that Rothbard is making the point that in a sense, the the laborer owns his or her labor and is exchanging that for a present good, a a paycheck. Mm -hmm. And the product of their labor is going to be a future good with some level of uncertainty later enjoyed by the capitalist who's either selling it uh, as as an intermediate or as a final good. So Mm -hmm. the the worker has some say in his life. The worker is engaging in a, an entrepreneurial activity of his or her own and making a choice. Yeah, definitely. This is perhaps jumping a bit ahead to the next chapter, but Rothbard is at pains to stress that labor in general is the most non-specific factor of production. So the laborers are free. Again, in general, there will obviously be specific, highly trained workers who are very specific to one particular line of production. But labor in general will be free to move to where they can get the highest uh, return on their labor. This doesn't mean that, I don't know, unskilled workers in Texas will move to Vermont as soon as they hear they can get one dollar more per hour. Mm-hmm. But it does mean that maybe unskilled workers in New York will move to Vermont and unskilled laborers in Pennsylvania will move to New York and so on. And it also means that as soon as, say, uh, there are higher uh, wages to be made, say, in engineering. Some people who had considered training to become a doctor will shift to engineering. And in this way, again, there's a, a general connexity of all labor markets, as well as a general connexity of all prices in the market economy. Now, I will say this uh, uh, in defense of the workers here. Uh, Rothbard's talking about understanding interest is, is something that's expressed in the pure rate of interest expressed mm-hmm. via time preference. Now, when we talk about present goods and future goods, really rich people have lots of present goods. Mm-hmm. In other words, they have lots of money. They have a, a good house, cars, food, all that sort of stuff. So in a sense, it's easier for them to have low time preference because they're 
their present goods are satisfied. And so they can sort of think more long term, put money away for their kids, mm-hmm. in, invest in some sort of long term investment, whether that's a factory or something else. So it's a little easier for them to have low time preference, to be fair, than it is for someone who is living very close to the bone, very, very paycheck to paycheck, very hand to mouth. So mm-hmm. in a, we, you and I, and I think our listeners understand that in a sense, low time preference is actually a process of civilization. We want that structure of production vertically to be extended. We want lots of lots of higher order goods. That's what makes a society wealthy, greater productivity. Yeah. But when when you get to, to poor countries, um, a lot more people almost have to have high time preference because they just have to survive. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, again, if we go back to the basics, time preference means that you prefer present satisfaction of your needs to future satisfaction. Now, obviously, if you are very poor, either because you live in a poor country or because you just haven't uh, inherited or accumulated any wealth of your own, you won't be in the same position to save and invest as you would be if you lived in another country, in a richer country, or had a higher income or just had a higher inherited a sum of cash. Now, this doesn't mean that we or poor people should look down on, on rich people for saving and investing and thinking that this is just the privilege of, of the wealthy or like the frivolities of playboys and stuff like that. The benefits that wealthy people get from saving and investing, the only yield you can really expect is the going rate of interest more or less, the market rate of interest. That is, it'll come down to the uh, pure rate determined by time preference. Most of the... Uh, Benefits from investing, capital accumulation and so on, will redound to the workers because investment and capital accumulation, the invention of new production processes and so on, will all serve to uh, greatly increase the productivity of labor. Again, because labor is the most non-specific factor of production, so the laborers can always move to where their employment is most highly valued. This, by the way, is why... uh, Mises again and again would stress that there's really only one thing that poor countries are lacking in order to become wealthy countries, and that is capital accumulation. So that is the only way for them to raise their standard of living. So uh, alluding again to a conversation we had offline, we were talking about how in sort of the conceptual uh, nature of interest rates, there are, there are people who want to save money. Uh, who want to consume less than they produce, and then there's people who want to borrow money, who want to consume more than they produce now and, and, and pay interest down the road as a result. And so there ought to be a meeting between lenders and borrowers that where they kind of get together and based on their particular time preferences on either end, uh, uh, come together and agree on an interest rate or a price, a ratio. But a lot of Austrian critics today, and there are many, uh, say, no, 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 this is not how the real world works anymore, Jeff. And, uh, you know, we can just use modern monetary theory to produce money at the treasury level, and we can use tax policy to constrict it and pull some out when we need to if inflation overheats, and that uh, interest rates are, in effect, a policy tool. And they can be commanded by fiat, rather yeah. either by a central bank, which is targeting through its uh, purchases and that sort of thing, its rate setting function, or it can literally be commanded by a legislature, by a treasury in, in a country. So talk about this tension. There, there are an awful lot of uh, economists today who think that what the Fed does is just uh, and something that we all have to accept. It's sort of like the weather. Of course, there are central mm-hmm. banks. Of course, they have an interest rate targeting function and that you Austrians are crazy to think that, the, that all this can be done sort of naturally. Yeah I, mean, yeah, I mean, it's worth pointing out that all Rothbard is really talking about here in this chapter is the natural rate of interest, the price spread between input prices and output prices. Now, as I mentioned earlier, interest is always expressed in terms of money, either because it's a money loan or because you appraise both input and output in money terms. Now, it, it, it must be stressed that there's nothing, um, how should I put this? The interest rate is, is purely natural, integrated in the economic system. So it doesn't depend on any kind of rate of inflation, any kind of money production at all. So long as we can just express it in money terms, that's all we need. But obviously, it is possible for uh, 
central banks and legislatures to have a lot of effect, let's just call it that, on how market interest rates are formed, precisely because you can pour in a lot of money into the financial system and thereby affect the contract rate of interest, which will again uh, have effects on the real structure of production. Now, this doesn't mean that central banks or governments can just have whatever rate of interest they please, right? because they, they still have to work through the institutions of the market economy. At the end of the day, the Federal Reserve can only set a specific interest target and have the rest of the economy adhere to it if they are willing to, um, to do whatever it takes, as Mario Draghi said a few years ago, and do whatever it takes at the end of the day basically means pumping in money. Mm-hmm being willing to buy uh, to buy up financial contracts and and stuff like that. Right. So the interest rate will tend to rise if if they if they're not suppressing it certainly in the environment yeah. in the last 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Um the, the the final outcome of of any kind of inflation and by inflation we of course means increases in the money supply will always be a tendency for prices to increase to a higher level than they had before. And this will also um have an effect on the rate of interest, but only during the inflationary episode. Just an, an easy uh, exposition of how this will take place is if, let's say, businessmen expect that in the future prices will increase, they'll be willing to borrow money now in order to make their purchases now at the lower prices. But since they then have an increased demand for loans, this will push the interest rate on loan con- contracts up. And we will thus see the emergence of an inflation premium in the loan rate of interest. But this will obviously only endure for as long as in inflation takes place. If uh, money production ceases and once all the effects on prices have uh, taken place, then we'll go back down to the natural, natural rate of interest. But this new natural rate of interest is not necessarily the same as the old one. Not only because people in the interim may have changed their minds, they have may have change their value scales, but also because the inflationary episode is uh, re- redistributes wealth. Often, I mean, the larger the inflation, the more extreme the redistribution. And there's no reason to think that the new wealthy people will have the same time preference rates as the people who uh, were, were wealthy before. So let's think about this in terms of so-called negative interest rates. Now, even in the United States, Adjusted for inflation, we arguably have negative interest rates now, but we don't have nominally negative interest rates like we do with uh, European sovereign debt and also with a lot of European corporate debt. Uh, Mises goes out of his way to say that uh, originary interest will always be positive and can never be negative. Rothbard doesn't stress that as much, but clearly uh, what we think of as a pure uh, rate of interest based on time preference by definition is positive. So what what are negative interest rates and how did they come about? Again, it's we shouldn't be fooled by what people call various phenomena in the market. So the market rate of interest on some government bonds have turned negative. Yes, but that doesn't mean that the rate of interest, as we understand it, the pure rate of interest is negative precisely because it can only be positive. So the real question we have to ask ourselves is why are some financial institutions willing to buy and own government bonds that not only doesn't yield anything, but they actually have to pay a percentage each year just to hold it? And for the most part, that this is institutional investors. Very few yeah, individuals yeah, do this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think many individuals would be willing to make that trade. But I mean, there are a few uh, reasons we can suggest why institutions would be willing to do this. The first one is that even though the yield, the nominal yield on the bond is negative, um, as you said yesterday, the, the value of the bond might go up in the future. So they, they might just speculate on reselling it down the road, and in that way, they'll have a positive yield. Right. So that's a capital gain, potentially, yeah. a, separate yeah. from the interest question. Yeah. But still, in our terms, they hold the bond in the present because they expect to be able to resell it in the future. So it is explained by our theory. By time preference. By time preference, yeah. A second possibility is that there are very stringent uh, capital requirements on banks and financial institutions and so on. 
So they are basically, if they want to operate, they are forced to hold a certain part of their assets in, in government bonds again, or various other kinds of uh, high quality, um, or what are deemed high quality assets, I should say. And in this sense, we, I think we should just say that, well, then the negative yield is just a tax. They have to pay it in order to be able to operate. A third possibility is that these uh, government bonds are all deemed to be very high quality, AAA rated, and they are therefore usable uh, as collateral in uh, in further financial operations and in uh, repo contracts and so on, and can in this way form the basis of, of what we are not the basis, but rather an, an important part of what we uh, usually term the, the shadow banking system. So based on this good collateral in quotation marks, banks can leverage up and extend loans. And in this way, because these loans will then have a positive interest rate in this way, they can make money. So there's an appendix at the end of this chapter, Appendix 10, about Schumpeter and it talks about the, even in uh, even in an evenly rotating economy, the construct which we talked about earlier in the book, where te- technology and markets and, and uh, supply and demand are fixed and knowable. That even in in this case, uh, the Austrian conception of pure time theory would posit a positive rate of interest, whereas Schumpeter argued that the net that interest rates would tend towards zero. So. What's the why is Appendix Ten in here? What's what's Rothbard uh, t- teaching us about Schumpeter's error in his view? Yeah, Rothbard had uh, a couple of engagement with uh, let's call it Schumpeterian economics throughout his career. He has this uh, short appendix, and later on he wrote a critique of Schumpeter called "Breaking Out of a Walrasian Box." But what he's saying is that again, that Schumpeter is not, although he was an Austrian economist in that he was from Austria. He wasn't really <laughs> an Austrian school economist. Um, and Schumpeter is... He was op- an Austrian Austrian, but yeah, not exactly. really Austrian. Exactly. And Schumpeter is, is operating in, in the framework where time preference is optional. It's not a fundamental category as we perceive it. And since, therefore, capit- uh, time preference, I should say, has no relation to the formation and maintenance of capital, of a structure of production... I mean, it just falls away by the wayside. And and therefore, Schumpeter comes to the conclusion that we don't really need interest rates, or we will not have interest rates, rather, in equilibrium. It is, uh, talking of Schumpeter, it is uh, interesting to note that Schumpeter has a theory of economic cycles that we uh, need not go into the details here, but about how entrepreneurs make new innovations, new inventions that upset the Valrasian general equilibrium. So we have have creative destruction. We have the emergence of interest rates, of rates of profit, until the economy, until all the innovations have been adapted into the system, and we settle down into a new equilibrium. Now, the interesting point to note is that there is that Schumpeter's theory of of business cycles is not really an entrepreneurial theory, because there is a sort of shadow partner in Schumpeter's system, and that is the banker who is willing to extend new credits, uncovered credits, to the entrepreneurs and who are willing to finance this, again, out of any, uh, not out of any previous saving, but just out of extending credit. So it's it's uh, a point that uh, uh, Professor Hülsman has has made in some of his lectures, and it's uh, that, that there's always a monetary aspect to these business cycles theory, and it's a point that Mises also made at some po- at many points in his own writings that Nobody has ever really refuted the monetary theory of the business cycle because they all at some point either explicitly or tacitly introduce uh, credit expansion in their own theories. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you read Chapter 6 of Man, Economy, and State, and in the second Scholar's Edition, this is pages 367 to 451, you're going to know everything you need to know about interest rates. And so much of what uh, Christopher Hansen and I have been talking about today relates to time. I mean, so much goes back to the temporal nature of economics. And so oftentimes what you're taught in so-called mainstream economics, time is not a factor. And that's why Henry has its famous dictum. You have to look at the effect of an economic policy, not only on everyone, not just a particular group, but over the long term. And I think if you read Rothbard, if you read Mises, if you follow the Austrian school, you will come to understand that interest rates just like other currencies, just like other commodities, just like wages, just like prices – 
uh, just like economic activity in general, do not need to be engineered. They don't need to be commanded. We don't need a central bank to create interest rates for us. Uh, we don't even need FDIC insurance. So there's all kinds of things that the market can do uh, with, without these guiding hands. And that's really what uh, the overriding lesson I think you can take away from this chapter. Now, I've mentioned a couple of different times that this book is available for free at Mises.org. Just type in Man, Economy, and State, and you're going to pull up a very beautiful, searchable HTML uh, file format that you can read this book in, you know, crystal clear as an EPUB or on your Kindle or whatever kind of device. We also have a beautiful hardcover available from the Mises uh, Institute bookstore, which with the code HAPOD takes $5 off. I believe it's only $20. And we have a, a paperback, which you can slip in your backpack, which comes down to only $10 with the code HAPOD. So this is one of those four or five, I think, seminal books in, in the Austrian literature that you're going to want to own in physical form. And we're going to be back next week as we continue going through this whole concept of production and how, how goods and services come to the economy. Rothbard gives it several hundred pages, and uh, we are going to get into the role of the entrepreneur and all the various factors. Uh, but this week, we had to take a little bit of diversion and just talk about interest rates because, as Christopher Hansen points out, this is the stage in the book where we need interest rates to explain uh, subsequent developments. So this book is laid out in a sense, chronologically, I don't know if that's the word, but certainly in a way where you, the, each chapter builds upon the last. And so we, we, you know, we're setting the stage for uh, all, all kinds of interesting things to come, especially power and market at the end, where uh, Rothbard takes on the, the, the central idea that we need a state to, among other things, run our economy. So all that said, Christopher Hansen, I want to thank you for your time today. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I hope you have a great weekend. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org. Mises.org.